This is Solve It for Kids. Hello, my amazing and curious friends. My name is Jennifer, and this is Solve for Kids, the podcast that gives kids and families a peek inside the real world of scientists, engineers, and experts as they solve problems in their jobs using creativity, cooperation, and critical thinking. And now, please welcome to the show my brand new podcast partner, Galactic Space Geek, Jeff Gagne! Hello, Jennifer! I am super excited to get to today's podcast! Yeah, we are going to have so much fun! What is the topic for today? How do you have a snowball fight on Mars? That sounds like the coolest thing ever. Who's our guest that's going to tell us all about this? So the person that knows all about snowball fighting on Mars is Miss Suzanne Slade. She is both a mechanical engineer and a children's author. And she wrote a book all about Mars. Yes, and Suzanne's been on the show, so we are so excited to welcome you back. Welcome to the show, Suzanne. Well, thank you, Jen and Jeff. I am so excited to be on Solve It for Kids. Yes, and we're excited to have you back because your first episode, which was, what, how to build a rocket without blowing it up, is a huge success. Lots of people have listened to that one. Well, I'm happy they're enjoying it. And now we get to take it a little bit further. A lot of that episode was rockets to get astronauts to the moon, and now we get to talk all the way out to Mars. Yes, exciting. All right. And now, so tell us a little bit about Mars. Like, how did you come to know anything about Mars? And I guess everything you've learned about Mars. Well, I'll tell you, Jen, this project for my new book, which is called Mars Is, it started when I was in a bookstore because where do you discover cool stuff but in a bookstore? True. And there I saw a book on the cover that had a picture of Mars. I opened it up and it had the most phenomenal, amazing photos of Mars I've ever seen. They totally blew me away. I'd never seen anything like it. And I noticed that they were taken by HiRISE, a camera called HiRISE, which is an acronym that stands for High Resolution Imaging Science Equipment. Excuse me, experiment. (laughs) I always get that wrong. But what that means is, High rise is the most powerful camera ever sent to another planet. And right now, at this moment, High rise is orbiting Mars about 200 miles from its surface, taking more photos of Mars. It's been doing this for 15 years. It's taken over 69,000 photos of Mars. Wow. And what's so amazing is they're very detailed and... The scientists who created this camera, they then color enhance the photos in a very special way that allows scientists to see details their eyes could never detect without this color enhancement. And they can figure out the types of minerals or rocks they're looking at. They look at canyons and craters and volcanoes, even snow and ice on Mars. Wow. It sounds like this camera is the answer to every time I've been asked, why are humans trying to go to Mars? <laughs> exactly. It sounds like an awesome place. It is an awesome place. And it has wind, clouds, and weather, and seasons, just like Earth. Only it's a lot colder than Earth. The average temperature on Mars on an average day is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's on a good day? Does it get colder than that? (laughs) That's an average. Okay, so it'll vary. The coldest it can get at Mars at night is minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a huge deal. And the highest temperature during the day is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. But that average is that minus 80 I was talking about. But you have to have equipment to be on Mars. Like humans can't breathe on Mars, correct? Correct, right. The atmosphere around Mars is mostly CO2, carbon dioxide. And you know, we, our lungs like oxygen. So no, you couldn't be on Mars without special equipment so that you could breathe and the temperatures would be regulated for the human body. So our question for you today, Suzanne, was how do you have a snowball fight on Mars? 
Has this high-rise camera taken photos of snow on Mars? It sure has. So what you have on Mars is a north and south pole, kind of like the poles we have on Earth. And those poles are covered with a crust of frozen carbon dioxide ice. But below that carbon dioxide layer is actually frozen snow and ice made of water, H2O, snow and ice, like we have on Earth. And if you go a little bit away from the poles, more towards the center of Mars, now you're not at the equator yet, you're not in the middle, but if you move kind of halfway between-ish, not too far below the surface, or what they call the subsurface, a couple centimeters to one or two meters, is more ice and snow made of water. So what happens is when you want to have that snowball fight on Mars, you're going to look around and see if a meteor has recently come in and crashed into Mars. Okay? Does that, that happens, happen right? a lot? The meteors crash there? It does happen a lot. Oh my gosh. So when that happens, right, that throws all the material out. It creates what's called an impact crater from the impact of the meteor. And then at the bottom of that, and High Rise has photographed this, is a little white dot and that is snow and ice so you're going to run down in that crater you're going to grab <laughs> that snow and ice and you're going to have that snowball fight and that snow and ice will last a couple days to maybe a couple months depending on where it's located and the season that mars is in at that time if it's a warmer season or a cooler season but as we know the hottest it'll get is 86 degrees so it's not a real hot planet so the snow and ice doesn't stick around for very long. Is it like snow and ice we'd find here on our planet or is it kind of different? It wouldn't be quite as fluffy as ours because it has been its subsurface, meaning it's been below the surface. Oh, okay. It's been sitting under there for thousands or maybe tens of thousands of years from the time when scientists believe Mars had water and lakes. And so that has been frozen beneath there for a long time. So it'll be, I think, packed up. Now, I haven't myself had my first snowball fight yet there, so I'm, I'm planning to do that once once maybe Elon Musk Once you get up. there. <laughs> yeah, once I can get on that rocket, but I'd say not as fluffy of snow as we have on Earth. So I'm, I'm imagining kids reading your book and seeing these pictures and picturing themselves being bundled up in their space snowsuits, but... What you're saying is they're actually going to have to do a little work to sort of loosen up this ice, turn it into snow, so they can form it into balls and throw at each other. I would imagine that's true, Jeff. Yes. Oh, and I just thought of something. Mars only has 38% of the gravity of Earth, which means kids are going to be able to throw snowballs. What is that? Three times farther? Well, a lot farther for sure. It's kind of like. When, remember Alan Shepard put his golf ball on the moon, remember? That's right. And he snuck a, a golf club head on a, a board on his Apollo mission. Nobody knew at Mission Control he had done that. Then he ties it on the end of a tool and he, you know, swung. Of course, he didn't hit the ball the first couple swings because his suit was kind of stiff, you know? Yeah. But when he finally made contact with that ball, he yells out, he goes, miles and miles and miles is what he said, because the ball just took off. And this was on the moon with one sixth the gravity of Earth. So it eventually came down, though, right? It didn't just go off into the... Yeah, theoretically, it should have come down. Now, they didn't, no one saw it. There's no <laughs> photographic evidence. But yes, it would come down. It certainly would. So this would be a very interesting snowball fight, right? I mean, not to mention the fact that you would potentially be floating here. Would you actually be walking on the planet? You would be walking. You would have your suit designed so that there would be enough weight to keep you down. You certainly would be on the surface, but it'd be a nice, light, bouncy walk. If you've ever seen the videos of the Apollo, it's kind of a hoppy. I Once I interviewed Alan Bean, he was the fourth man on the moon and he talked about you kind of almost like tiptoeing like off of your toes you're kind of hot gliding almost that sounds like a lot of fun i know so the title of your new book is mars is is there a completion to that in the book somewhere <laughs> well the subtitle is it was mars is stark slopes 
silvery snow, and startling surprises because there are a lot of surprises on Mars. And yes, in the text, it's kind of a repeating verse. It'll say Mars is, and then it'll tell you what it is. It's buried bedrock is how it starts out. Buried bedrock is a really hard rock that's kind of foundational to the Mars surface. Bubbling gas. There are places where gas is escaping up through where the carbon dioxide ice is melting. And mighty mesas. And mesas are large structures in the desert because, you know, Mars has huge deserts where the wind is blowing. And I think one of the cool things, one of the many cool things the high-rise camera captures is it will, can photograph the same location at different times so it can see how that area is changing over time. And scientists, they studied some deserts and they have found that in a Martian year, which is 687 Earth days, that's how many days it takes Mars to circle the sun. You know, it takes our planet 365 days because we're a little closer to the sun. But during a Mars year, the sand dunes on Mars will travel about three feet or one meter. That's how far they will be blown. The entire dune will move. And this high-rise camera takes photos of these same places so you can compare? Right, right. They calculated. They watched how the dunes moved along. And then they calculated how fast that sand is traveling. So they do many amazing things with these high-rise photos. So how long did it take the high-rise camera to get into place once they actually launched it and so forth? Well, it was launched back in 2005, so this is not a new mission. And that's the other thing that surprised me was that I hadn't heard about this until about three years ago when I started working on the book. And it took seven months for the camera to reach Mars, and then it got into orbit. It started orbiting. And the camera is riding on another spacecraft called MRO which stands for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And there's a few other pieces of equipment on MRO too, but the main, the really exciting piece is this high-rise camera. And so then it started orbiting and shortly after that took its first photo. And then of course, it's gonna transmit the photos back to Earth, right? So they're sending these transmissions through space on average about 140 million miles, okay? And on average, it takes about 15 minutes to send that photo back to Earth. And then they can process the photos at the high-rise organization there at the University of Arizona is where the experts, the high-rise experts are located. And then they put the new photos on their catalog. And anybody can go look at the high-rise catalog and look at these 69,000 photos. So. Wow. Wow. It's really interesting to go and... That's that what sounds I, like a, a like a geek out weekend, right? You just sit there and look through all these amazing <laughs> photos and imagine yourself on Mars. Yes. And they have them organized by what you want to look at. They have them organized by sand dunes and craters and you can go and take a look. And of course, so then it was kind of hard to select which photos would we put in the book. I was going to ask. Now, I know how to make books and unfortunately, there's a limit to how many pages you get. So how do you pick... What are the coolest ones there? Did you kind of pick one from each different like topography? You beat me to the question, Jennifer. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I did was I knew I wanted to show, give examples of all these cool things on Mars, like the snow and ice, the volcanoes, craters, sand dunes, mesas, and this really interesting thing called an alluvial fan, which is like a rock that has a fan-shaped deposit. So it's proof that water was on Mars. So I looked to see that I could include photos of all these different things. And then I looked for the ones of these different types of features that were the most beautiful or fascinating, you know, so that together, different colors, so that together it was just a beautiful thing to behold. So in your book, the subtitle is, the third part of the subtitle, if I'm remembering correctly, was Stark Surprises. Startling surprises. Startling surprises. What was the most startling surprise for you in searching through all those high-rise images? Okay, that's a really good question. But I 
I think I'm going to go with a photo that we included of huge slabs of ice. It's near the back of the book with the text that says completely breathtaking. Whoa. And what is so beautiful is this is a photo near the South Pole. And some of the ice, the, the carbon dioxide ice that we were talking about, yeah, shapes in these huge slabs. And they almost look kind of like with rounded edges, kind of flowery. And on the outsides is this gold material, which they believe is colored by Mars dust trapped in the ice. And so wow. I think that one was one of the most fascinating. You know, it's really hard when you're looking at items this fascinating and gorgeous to pick your favorite, but that one was, <laughs> certainly surprised me. Well, we'll have to show that one on the website, see if we can find that or if kids can go look that up on the high rise. Oh, I'll send you a picture. Yeah. Oh, that works. So I'm curious, when this is orbiting, does the high rise change its orbit like continuously or something so it can see different areas of Mars? Okay, great question. Mars is half the size of Earth, yet it has the same surface area as Earth. So there's a lot of land to cover on Mars. And I believe High Rise has only photographed around 4% of it. So scientists are very careful to select what they want to see. And there's another camera on MRO, on this spacecraft, that does a broader picture. And so then if they see something interesting in that, then they take high rise and they zoom in on this very fascinating thing they want to look at. Something I find interesting is high rise is called the people's camera, which means it belongs to everybody in the world. And if a scientist or somebody else really wanted to take a close look at something, perhaps it's Olympus Mons, which is the tallest volcano in the entire solar system, which is on Mars. If someone wanted pictures of that or something else, they can put in a request through the High Rise website to say, I would like you to get pictures of this. And if they think this sounds like a good idea, they'll do it. They will take pictures of what people want to see. So it is the people's camera. Wow, that's fascinating. That's really cool. In doing some research for this podcast, I happened to look up the High Rise website to see some of these photos, even though I had no idea there were more than 69,000. Wow. I thought I saw a photo that the high-rise camera took of the Perseverance rover that just landed on Mars. Has it done that? You're right, Jeff. And not only did it pick a picture of Perseverance rover on the ground, but as Perseverance rover was approaching Mars, MRO was positioned properly, obviously they had planned ahead, to take photos as it was approaching Mars. So then they could see if everything happened properly, if the parachute deployed properly. And they even had looked to see where all of the parts landed from Perseverance's landing. So they said, oh, the rover's the parachute's over here, the rover's here. So those photos are helping NASA know how the mission went and if they needed to change or improve anything, when they might send another rover or even people. Wow. That is cool. I mean, that means that this was years in planning, right? I mean, to put all these things together. Correct. High Rise has taken photos of previous rover missions as well. And the photos are so detailed, they can see the rover's tracks in the Mars dust. So they can see the exact path that a rover has traveled. So they don't have to wonder, where did the rover go? They can see it. They can see exactly where it went and where it is. Again, very cool. Jennifer, I think you hit it right on the head. I think this is going to be some space loving geeks, a different <laughs> version of a Netflix marathon. Yes. We're going to be trying to find all the pictures of all the rovers and their wheel tracks in the 69,000 high rise photos. Don't worry, they have filters too where you can filter these. You don't have to just oh. look. <laughs> <laughs> it's going that to be would have been a long time. marathon. <laughs> no. <laughs> The High Rise website is really great, and they'll, it'll help you navigate to what you would like to see. You said you found out about the High Rise camera about three years ago. 
even though it's been up there for 15 years. How did you first learn about it? Like I mentioned, I was in a bookstore doing a book event for another book. And then I noticed, because I tend to gravitate towards all things space, there was a book that was catching my eye in the back of the room that just said Mars in big letters. And then I went and looked at it, and it is called Mars, the Pristine Beauty of the Red Planet. But this is a big, huge book. It's over 450 pages long and 17 chapters. I mean, there's a lot of great information. But I thought, how could I take this fascinating information and some of the most beautiful high-rise photos and put it into a book that children, young readers, and older readers would enjoy? So that was my goal. And I mean, this book, I haven't gotten your book yet, but it's coming soon. And I'm very excited. Now I'm curious to see all of the pictures that you chose because I know that it's really amazing. So here on Solve for Kids, since you've been here before, you know that we like to give our young listeners a challenge. Do you have a challenge for them, Suzanne? I have some fun challenges, Jen. I thought, since I can tell your listeners love Mars, why not send them to Mars, okay? Oh, can we go too? (laughs) You can go too. So here's what you can do. There's three ways you can go to Mars. I've got three for you, and they're all free. One, go to NASA's Mars selfie booth, or it's Mars photo booth, and the link will be right there on your podcast. Then you can take a photo, a selfie of yourself on Mars, and you'll see also on your podcast website the selfie of me on Mars. And also you can get a selfie of yourself in Mission Control. So number one, you're going to take a selfie of yourself on Mars. Number two, there's a link on your podcast where you can listen to what things sound like on Mars. Because as we talked about, the air on Mars is different than the air on Earth. And sound waves travel through air, so you sound different. So you can record your voice, make a greeting from Mars for their fellow Earthlings back on Earth. And then you can replay it and listen to what your voice sounds like on Mars. And the third thing you can do is send your name to Mars on the next mission. And when you do that, you'll even get a boarding pass with your name on it. It'll tell you the date your name is leaving and you get credited for some frequent flyer miles. (laughs) It's really, it's over a billion. But look for that on, you'll see my boarding pass on the podcast and you can get your very own boarding pass and your name will be sent. I don't know on the next mission how it will be, but often they print it on a little tiny chip or something and then it goes it actually goes to mars your name will be on mars so three ways that your listeners can all go to mars that sounds terrific and i imagine kids are going to be doing that as soon as the podcast ends because those sound fun yeah exactly now what she's talking about is be sure to check out our website which is solveitforkids.com this episode like all the others will have its own website page with all of these cool pictures and links that suzanne was talking about and if you really get excited and do all your pictures you can tag us on social media and we would love to see the pictures of you on mars Yeah, I would love to see your listeners. And there are different scenes on Mars. You'll see I have one with rocks and hills behind me, but I would love to see those too. Well, this has been great. We've had a wonderful time talking about Mars. I cannot wait to go this weekend and take a look at all of those pictures. Thank you so much for being on Salt for Kids again, Suzanne. Well, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Wow, what an amazing first podcast for me to join. I learned so much about Mars. Yeah, Mars is amazing, isn't it? And I don't know about you, Jeff, but I seriously want to see some of these pictures that these kids will take of themselves on Mars. We definitely need to see both those and the high-rise photos that we can look up online. How fantastic. That is so awesome. So kids, if you're listening with your parents' permission, Take your pictures of the high rise or a selfie of you with Mars and then find us on our social media, which is at KidSolve on Twitter or Instagram and be sure and tag us. And don't forget to check out all of the cool photos that Suzanne gave us on our website, which is Solve It for Kids. And now I can't wait until we have next week's episode together with Jeff and a brand new guest 
on Solve It For Kids!